السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اسٹوڈنٹس وی آر اسٹارٹنگ دا نیو سیکشن ٹوڈے تھرو دیس ویڈیوز اینڈ دیٹ از اباؤٹ دا کیلیفیٹ پیریڈ دا فسٹ کیلی واس حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ عنہ اینڈ ان دس سیکشن وی ول اسٹارٹ ڈسکشن فرام دا الیکشن وی ہیو آلریڈی ڈسکس دا سروسز آف دا رائٹلی گائیڈیڈ کیل اس ڈیورنگ دا لائف ٹائم آف دا ہولی پروفٹ وی سی اپون ہیم ان دا چیپٹر آف ٹین بلیسڈ کمپینین سو ان دس سیکشن Uh, my book five covers all these topics about the caliphate period. We start discussion from the election of the caliph and then we discuss the achievements as a caliph and uh, their character, their admin, their conquests and we will discuss it till the death of the caliphs. So election of Abu Bakr is uh, something which they have already asked many times previously in the papers. And they can ask questions about the election of the caliphs in the upcoming papers as they have already asked about the conversion of the rightly guided caliphs previously. There was the question they asked, give an account of the conversion of the uh, four rightly guided caliphs to Islam. Similarly, recently they have asked about the shahadat of the any two of the last three caliphs. Similarly, they can make a question about the election as well and they can ask you to write about the election of the four rightly guided caliphs. And in part B, they can ask you, explain what we can learn today about the appointment of the head of the state through these elections of the caliphs. It can be a very good evaluative question for part B. So you have to focus on the election also about all the caliphs and you have to remember that how they were elected by the Sahaba community. So when Holy Prophet peace be upon him passed away, he was not even buried, but he was being bathed and he was being shrouded when the Ansar companions assembled in a place called Saqifah Banu Sa'id. And they were going to choose the Khalifa of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him from their community. From their community, the chief of Hazrat was Sa'ad bin Ubada. They wanted to appoint him as the Caliph. You know that the most influential leader of uh, Ansar was the chief of Oz, Hazrat Saad bin Mu'az radiallahu an, but he had already passed away after giving his judgment about Banu Quraysa in 5 AH. So now the chief of Banu, uh, chief of Hazrat, Hazrat Saad bin Ubada was the most influential person. So they wanted to appoint him as the first caliph. But when Muhajireen companions got to know about it, they rushed to that place and they participated in the meeting. It will be too strange for you to think that how, why these people are running for the caliphate and Holy Prophet peace be upon him was not even buried. You need to understand that the Holy Prophet peace be upon him's effort, the whole life he made efforts to establish an Islamic state. And this decision, the appointment of the first caliph was extremely important at that time. And if uh, some incapable person would be appointed at that time as the head of the Islamic State, the entire effort of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him could go in vain. And no one could understand the importance of this decision better than Hazrat Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah because they remained with the Holy Prophet peace be upon him throughout the political struggle. That's why the senior Muhajireen, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah went to Saqifah Banu Sa'id where all the Ansar Sahaba had gathered and they said, how can you take such an important decision without the involvement of Muhajireen in it? So the meeting started all over again and now both the communities mentioned their services. Ansar claimed the right of caliphate, they said it's our town and we call you people here, we gave you asylum and shelter here, we shared our properties with you. So obviously the Khalifa should be chosen from Ansar community. On the other side, Muhajireen had many things to mention as their services, they claimed Khilafat is our right. They said we are more senior Muslims, 13 years, more experienced Muslims than Ansar. And they had uh, sacrificed all the things in the town of Makkah and then they migrated to Medina. That's why and Muhajireen wanted the Khalifa should be chosen from their leaders. There was not an individual claiming the right of Caliphate, but Ansar wanted their leaders to be the Khalifa and Muhajireen wanted some of their leaders to become the Khalifa. 
So then someone suggested that why don't we choose two caliphs, one from each community, one Khalifa should be from Muhajirin community, one from Ansar and both of them. We will decide the things with their mutual consultation with each other. In this way, both the communities will take part in the decision making. But this idea was instantly rejected by Hazrat Umar an because Hazrat Umar an was very wise and intelligent. He said, how can it be that there is one state and there are two caliphs of two authorities in it, with, uh, two caliphs with equal authority? Obviously, it will lead towards confusion and more division and dissension in the community. So, uh, over here, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah was also there. He also tried to convince Ansar that it was not their right. And Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah said, O oh Ansar, you are the first to uphold Islam. So don't be the first to sow the seed of dissension in it. He said to Ansar that you were the people who supported Islam in the early times. And just because of your support, Islam came, became so strong. So now why you are trying to divide the community and why you are trying to damage it? And he tried to convince them the right belongs to Muhajirin. But the turning point of this meeting was a hadith which was narrated by Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an said that Holy Prophet peace be upon him said Al-A'immatu min Quraysh, Imam should be chosen from Quraysh. It means that if some capable person is available from Quraysh community, so he will be given the preference. On this, uh, and one more thing, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an also convinced Ansar about a political point. He said that Arabs will never be united in the leadership of any other person other than Quraysh. Arabs used to give respect to Quraysh. They would agree on the leadership of Quraysh. They will be united in, uh, under his leadership. But uh, no other leader can ever unite them in one place. When Ansar heard that hadith and understood this political significance of Quraysh, so they agreed and they stopped the claim of caliphate. And that was something uh, we need to appreciate. It was a great sacrifice that Ansar understood the situation and they didn't claim for caliphate anymore. They said, okay, you can choose Khalifa from Quraysh now. So Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an said that Umar is here, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah is here. Both are senior Muslims, very knowledgeable and wise Muslims and companions of the Prophet. Choose any one of these two as your leader, as your Khalifa. But they both said that no one is better than Abu Bakr. In the presence of Abu Bakr, no one else deserves to be the Khalifa. And Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an stood first and he asked Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an to give me your hand so that I will do pledge on your hand. So first of all, Hazrat Abu Bakr did that pledge and then all the other companions locked to Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an and they accepted him as the Khalifa. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala an was not present at that occasion here. He was busy in giving baths and in shrouding the Holy Prophet peace be upon him. So he did the pledge later. After being appointed, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an delivered a small speech in which Hazrat Abu Bakr said that I am appointed as your leader, but I am not better than you. So if I am right, so help me in it. And if I am wrong, then set me right. That was the first thing Hazrat Abu Bakr said as the Khalifa. So this is about the election of Hazrat Abu Bakr. But there was a question in past papers in part B, evaluative question in which it said, that do you think that Abu Bakr's election was justified or not? You have to give your opinion in it. So obviously, if the Sunni candidates are there, they will definitely support this thing that Abu Bakr's election was justified. And you know that in a Shia perspective, Hazrat Ali's right was there to become the Khalifa. So they can disagree and they can also give their points, whatever they think that why Ali should become the Khalifa. They will be credited also if their points will be uh, is strong. But Sunni students will obviously say that Abu Bakr's election was 100% justified and they have to support it with many of the reasons. One of the, one of the reasons can be that uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was the most senior companion of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him. You know that he was the first free adult man to accept Islam. 
Secondly, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and was the most devoted companion of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him because you know no other companion set the example like the example of Hazrat Abu Bakr in the cave of Saur when the poison was slowing in his leg and he did not even move his leg just because the Prophet will be disturbed while he was sleeping. And no one donated everything at the time of the book expedition like Hazrat Abu Bakr. So his level of devotion was beyond limits. Besides that, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala knew the policies of the Holy Prophet which we upon him better than all other companions. Holy Prophet always consulted him in all important decision making and many a times he followed the suggestion of Hazrat Abu Bakr. And we know that no one was understanding the significance, the political importance of the Treaty of Debiya other than Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. So he was extremely politically wise person. Besides that, Holy Prophet peace be upon him gave a clear evidence of his seniority and his uh, leadership qualities when the Holy Prophet peace be upon him appointed him as the Imam of his mosque in his sickness. And he said, whenever I will not come, Abu Bakr will lead you. So that's why the companions, they saw that uh, Holy Prophet peace be upon him made him a leader in Salah. So we should also make him the leader in our worldly affairs as well. So there are many points you can give in the support of the justification of Abu Bakr's election as the first caliph. And even after becoming the Khalifa, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an justified his election because the situation which was there, uh, we will discuss it, it um, shortly, that uh, there was a apostasy movement and there were so many issues and problems arose at the same time. Only it was Abu Bakr's vision, Abu Bakr's wisdom, his faith, his firmness and courage uh, that he solved all those issues and gave strong footings to the Islamic Empire. In this way, you can support your point that Abu Bakr's election was justified. Now, the events of Hazrat Abu Bakr's Caliph, one of the events is called Expedition to Syria. It's a different event, it's a small event discussed separately uh, during the Caliphate of Hazrat Abu Bakr. And you will write down this topic, even uh, the Expedition to Syria, while you will be writing about the important events of Abu Bakr's Caliphate. You will say that when Holy Prophet peace be upon him passed away, Holy Prophet we see upon him had sent an army before his death towards Syria in order to take the revenge of Hazrat Zaid bin Harissa's murder. Zaid bin Harissa radiallahu an, you know was martyred in the battle of Muta and his killer was not killed. Muslims knew that he ran away and he was not killed. So Holy Prophet we see upon him wanted to take the revenge of the murder of his adopted son. So he arranged an army for this purpose and he appointed Usama bin Said bin Harissa as the commander of this army. And Usama was only 17 years old, but he was the son of Said bin Harissa. So obviously no one could take more uh, efficiency, uh, will not be shown by anyone else other than Usama bin Said bin Harissa. But the army was not far away from Medina when Holy Prophet peace be upon him died. And after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, many problems arose in Arabia, false prophets, refusal of zakat and other issues. So the companions were asking Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an to stop the army and do not send this army to Syria because we need them in Arabia. But Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an said that no, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, wish will be carried out. The companions asked Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an to change the leader of the army at least because Usama bin Zaid was too young and he had no experience of uh, battles. But again Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and many senior companions are also going in that army like Hazrat Usman and others. But Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an said that how can I depose a person appointed by the Holy Prophet peace be upon him, how can it be? You people mean that the Holy Prophet peace be upon him's appointment was wrong and Abu Bakr is going to correct it. How can it be? So Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and sent that army in the leadership of Osama bin Zaid bin Harissa. They went there, successfully killed the killer of Hazrat Zaid bin Harissa and after 40 days they came back, hands full of booty and no damage happened inside Arabia. 
But this incident tells us that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was a strict follower of the Holy Prophet's policies and he did not want to make any change in the decisions and in the policies of the Prophet. And it is a lesson for all the leaders of the Islamic states that Sunnah should be the guideline for them and they should try to follow the instructions of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him as much as possible. This is the only way of success for the Muslims today as well. The most important achievement of Hadrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala uh, was crushing the apostasy movement. When Holy Prophet peace be upon him passed away, so there was a big issue in the peninsula of Arabia. We call it apostasy movement. And Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala took action against them. And these battles are also known as Ridda Wars. But before uh, going into the detail of the apostasy, we need to understand the word apostasy. If a person is a Muslim, and then he starts denying some of the major Muslim beliefs. For example, if a person was a Muslim and then suddenly he started saying that I don't believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final and the last messenger of Allah. And he starts believing in someone else. So we will say that the person has become an apostate. Such a person has become murtad and he has gone out of the circle of Islam. Similarly, if a person was a Muslim and then he starts denying a pillar of Islam. For example, if a person was a Muslim and then he started saying that I don't believe that zakat is obligatory on me anymore. So we will say that uh, the person has become murtad, the person has become an apostate because he has denied a pillar of Islam, a major Muslim uh, belief and teaching. So, what to do with these apostates? If a person has done this kind of crime, so what is Islamic ruling about it? So, Islam says that a murtad in an Islamic state will be given only two options. There are only two things to be done with him. The first thing is that he will be given time to ponder over his uh, beliefs. And he, if he has some kind of confusion and question, he should ask it from the ulama. And he should correct his belief and he should do tawbah and come back on the right path. There is an option for it. He will be given time for that. But if a person will persist on his wrong beliefs and if he will refuse to come back on the correct teachings of Islam, so the other option is execution. There is no other way. Look, there is, it's not, uh, there is no compulsion in religion and Islam. You know, the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fiddeen. If a person was a Christian, if a person was a Jew, or if a person was a Hindu, uh, since his birth, his family was from that religion. So we cannot force that person to become Muslim if he is not willing to do that. But if a person has accepted Islam, if a person has understood all the teachings of Islam, and after that suddenly uh, he starts saying that uh, I, I don't believe in this major teaching of Islam or he starts saying that I studied some other religion and I think that some other religion is better than Islam. So that is something unacceptable because the arguments of Islam and the evidence of Islam is so clear that on the basis of knowledge no one can say that uh, some other religion is better than Islam. That's why there is no force on any person to accept Islam. But once a person has accepted Islam, there is no way out for him in Islam. Such a person will be executed. This is Islamic law in an Islamic state. And Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala was going to do the same thing during his caliphate with these apostates. So this is the introduction of apostasy. If there is a question in your past papers and it is a repeated and a recurring question in past papers that give an account of Hazrat Abu Bakr's action against false prophets, against apostate tribes. So you have to first give this introduction and then you will go into the detail of all the things. In the second paragraph, you should focus false prophets and you should give all the details about the false prophets there. There were four false prophets. The first one was Aswad Ansi. Aswad Ansi claimed to be a prophet during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And he was from Sana'a of Yemen. Sana'a is the capital of Yemen. He was from there. 
and uh, he was also known as the veiled prophet because he used to keep his face covered due to ugliness. Otherwise, the people wouldn't accept him as prophet because we know that all the prophets were also very handsome. So he used to keep his face covered and that's why he was known among the people as the real prophet. And uh, he claimed to be a prophet during the lifetime of the holy prophet peace be upon him and he was confusing the people regarding religion. So when holy prophet peace be upon him got to know about his activities, he said to his sahaba, someone should go to Yemen and kill this person because he is misguiding the people there. So in this way, the Holy Prophet peace be upon him himself clarified the policy and the rulings about the false prophets that either they should do Tawba or otherwise they will be executed. So one of the companions whose name was Firoz Delmi, he was Persian by origin. So he went to Yemen and over there uh, his cousin was also the wife of Aswadansi. Aswadansi had married his cousin uh, forcibly. And Feroz Delmi met her and they made a plan of the killing of Aswadansi. She informed Feroz Delmi that from which uh, passage we have to come and he will get the direct access to the bedroom of Aswadansi. So Feroz Delmi came to that room, killed Aswadansi, beheaded him and he threw his head among the people who were sitting outside from his followers and when they saw the head of Aswad Ansi amongst them so they all fled away and Firoz Delmi captured Sana'a but this all happened during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him what happened during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr we need to understand it and we have to mention it as well obviously in this answer so you will say that when apostasy became active in all different parts of Arabia, the apostates of Yemen also became united in the leadership of Qais bin Abd Yaghus. Students, in other sections, you, uh, you need to understand the quotations a lot, like in Articles of Faith, in the Pillars of Islam, there are so many quotations. In the Caliphate section, you will not be given the quotations because it is all history you will not find the references in the Quran and Hadith about these events we will discuss during the Caliphate period but you have to memorize lots of names of the personalities and uh, places and battles you need to remember the years in which the events took place that will be something challenging for you and you need to highlight these things in the notes and uh, you need to keep revising these things so that you can write down the accurate detail in the papers you know that uh, if you will not maintain accuracy in your answer, your level of your answer will be decreased and you cannot get the good marks then. So the lead name of the leader of apostates in Yemen was Qais bin Abdi Yahus. He united all the apostates and Firoz Delmi understood that he cannot control them. So as a strategy, Firoz Delmi went back to the, he retreated and he went to the mountainous region and he left the control of Sana'a and apostates occupied it. But Firoz Elmi didn't sit idle. Firoz Elmi remained busy in collecting the Muslim warriors. He continued training them. And when he arranged a good army, he came down from the mountains and then he attacked the apostates in Sana'a, defeated them and he recaptured Sana'a of Yemen. And this event is also known as the conquest of Yemen. It became the part of the Islamic State of Medina. And now Abu Bakr appointed Furuz Zelmi as the governor of Yemen. So this is all about Aswad Ansi you need to mention in your answer. The second false prophet you will talk about is Tuleha bin Khuwailid. Tuleha bin Khuwailid was from uh, Banu Asad tribe and he claimed to be a prophet after the death of the holy prophet peace be upon him and his tribe was in the north of Medina and on the back of this uh, tribe there was Syria and Syrians were giving support to Tuleha. The neighboring countries help those people in your country who are rebels and who create difficulties for the government and who try to damage the state internally. So that's why the Syrians were giving support to Tuleha and Tuleha was becoming a threat for the Islamic State in Medina. He himself was a warrior, he himself was a leader of the tribe and uh, he claimed to be a prophet. Many of his tribesmen and the neighboring tribes joined him. 
سو حضرت ابوبا کا صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ سین خالد بن ولید رضی اللہ عنہ ٹوورڈ سین ایکچولی ابو بکر ارینجڈ الیون کمانڈرز وتھ دی ٹروپس اینڈ ہی سینڈ دیم ان ڈفرنٹ ڈائریکشنز بٹ دی اسٹرانگیسٹ پنچ اف حضرت ابو بکر واز نن ادر دین خالد بن ولید سو ویئر ایور دی پرابلم واز گریو حضرت خالد بن ولید یوز ٹو گو دیر ٹو سالو اٹ حضرت خالد بن ولید کیم ہیئر اینڈ اے بیٹل ٹوک پلیس اگینسٹ طلحا وچ از نون ایز بیٹل اف بزاخا اینڈ ان دس بیٹل حضرت Khalid bin Walid defeated Tulaha's army, but Tulaha was not killed and he fled to Syria. And when Syria was conquered during the Caliphate of Hazrat Abu Bakr, so Tulaha accepted Islam and then Tulaha turned to be a good Muslim and he even participated in jihad in the battles of uh, Jalula, in the battle of Nehawan during the Caliphate of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu. The third false prophet was Sajjah. Sajjah was a lady and she belonged to the tribe of Banu Taghlib in Iraq. And she had the following as a soothsayer. She was a soothsayer and the people believed in her spirituality. And uh, when she got to know that Holy Prophet peace be upon him had passed away in Medina. So she wanted to come and occupy his place. So she was coming with around 4,000 of his uh, supporters and troops. But it was not a big challenge for Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid attacked all her army and defeated them. But Sajjah was not killed. Sajjah went to Musalma, another false prophet, and she got married with Musalma Kazab. And when Musalma Kazab was killed in the Battle of Yamama, Sajjah went back to Iraq. And when Iraq was conquered, she accepted Islam. She accepted Islam during the Caliphate of Hazrat Muawiyah. So she also did Tawbah. The fourth false prophet, Musalama Kazza, was the most dangerous one. Musalama belonged to the tribe of Banu Hanifa. And uh, Banu Hanifa was in Central Arabia. And Yamama was a town, was his stronghold. He was a very clever person. He attended the gatherings of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And he observed him, how he received revelations and how did he deliver the revelations to the companions and how he was running his uh, empire, his state. He observed it all and then he went back to his tribe and he wrote a letter to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And in the, that, that letter he claimed that Muhammad, Allah has given me prophethood as well. Now Arabia will be divided into two halves. Half of it will be mine and the other half will be yours. And when Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, was informed about this letter, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, instantly said, Kazab the liar, I am the last messenger of Allah. So since then he was called Musalama Kazab, Musalama the liar. But the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't get time to take action against him. These were the last few days of the Holy Prophet's life. So that's why the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away and after his death, Musalama became stronger. His followers started saying that your prophet is dead and our prophet is alive and a living prophet is better than a dead prophet. So, uh, and there was another reason of his strength and it was his marriage with, uh, with Sajja. When Sajja got married with Musalma, all the followers of Sajja joined Musalma and she resigned from her activities of prophethood and she said to his followers to start following Musalma. And at the time of their marriage, they legalized wine and gambling for uh, their followers. And they reduced the number of prayers for their followers to make them happy. And they got a large number of troops and followers. Musalma had gathered 40,000 troops uh, to support him in Yamama. And it was the biggest threat to the Islamic State of Medina. So, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and first sent Ikrama bin Abi Jahl against him. But Abu Bakr advised Ikrama not to attack Yamama but just to stand outside Yamama to make sure that the apostates of Yamama aren't going to the other places where Khalid bin Walid was busy in action. Actually, Khalid bin Walid was busy in clearing uh, apostasy in the other parts of Arabia. First he fought, fought in the uh, Battle of Buzakha 
and then he went to Ghamra, then Naqra, then he defeated a tribe Bani Zafar, then he took action against Banu Tamim, and then he had to come to Yamama. So that's why Hazrat Ikrama was supposed to wait for Khalid bin Walid, but Ikrama thought that he would defeat Musalma alone, and so he attacked Yamama. But he couldn't handle the large number of troops of Musalma and Muslims were defeated. And Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an was very much angry and he was very upset because Ikrama didn't follow the instructions of Hazrat Abu Bakr. Then Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an sent Shurahbil towards Yamama. But, Ikram, but Musalma's forces defeated Shurahbil as well. And then finally, Hazrat Khalid bin Walid came and Hazrat Khalid bin Walid attacked Yamama. Muslims are only 13,000, enemies were 40,000. But when the leadership was here in the hands of Khalid bin Walid, there was only one result, you know. Muslims always won that battle in which Khalid was present or Khalid led the battle. After a fierce and hot contest, Khalid bin Walid defeated the enemies and finally Musalama Kazab took, took refuge in a garden. It was a small fort in which he finally took uh, refuge, but Muslims killed Musalama inside that fort and the person who killed Musalama was Wahshi, the same person who had killed Hazrat Hamza radiallahu an. Uh, with a spear, he accepted Islam in the conquest of Makkah and after that he wanted to kill some of the big enemy of Islam and so he did it by killing Musalma in the battle of Yamama. This battle is known as the battle of Yamama, it is also known as the battle of the garden of death also. So in this bat single battle around 700 companions of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him were killed in and among those companions, around 360 were Huffaz. The figures are different, but a large number of Huffaz were martyred in this single battle. So this battle led up to the compilation of the Holy Quran. Uh, if the question is about the achievement of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, or if the question is about the main events of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq during his caliphate, so obviously you have to mention the compilation of the Holy Quran but not with too much detail because you know there are many events you have to mention so that's why you have to write it briefly and you will just say that when so many Huffaz were martyred in it so the first person who got the idea of the compilation of the Holy Quran was Hazrat Umar radiallahu an he came to Hazrat Abu Bakr and asked him to appoint someone for the compilation and it was a high time for it but you know, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala uh, was hesitant in it initially. He said, why should we do a work which was not done by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. But again and again, Umar talked on this issue and finally he convinced Abu Bakr to do it. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala used to say that Umar talked to me on this issue so many times that Allah opened my mind also for it. And when Abu Bakr agreed, he appointed Zaid bin Sabit for the compilation of the Holy Quran and the compilation was done within a few months. That was also one of the very important event of Abu Bakr's Caliphate. And you should also remember and keep in mind that as compilation of the Holy Quran is a very important topic for paper one, it is also a topic which can come in paper 2 and there are questions in past papers in paper 2 in which they ask about compilation because compilation of Hazrat Abu Bakr and the compilation during Usman's Caliphate are the important events of their Caliphate periods. Okay. We were talking about apostasy movement. So when you are writing a 10 mark answer of apostasy movement, so I told you in the first paragraph you will just introduce the apostasy, we will explain the meaning of it. The second paragraph, which will, the, which will be the most important and the largest paragraph will be about the false prophet. And then the third paragraph will be about refusal of zakat. I told you that if a person denies to uh, establish a pillar of Islam and he says that I don't believe in the obligation of this pillar, so such a person is also called an apostate. So after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, some tribes refused to pay zakat to Abu Bakr. These tribes were Banu Yarbu, Banu Murrah, Banu Tamim, Banu Abbas, 
and some other tribes, the people of Oman, uh, they said that payment of zakat was an agreement between us and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has passed away, so we are not going to give zakat to anyone else. That was their point of view. But Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and said that your point of view is totally wrong. You people didn't understand the meaning of zakat. Abu Bakr said it's a pillar of Islam and because you people are Muslim so you have to establish this pillar. You have to pay zakat regularly to the head of the state. And the head of the state is responsible, head of the state is responsible to establish all the pillars of Islam. There is a verse in Surah Hajj in which Allah says, "Alladina immakkanna hum fil ardi aqamu salat wa atabu zakat wa amaru bil ma'roof wa nahu an al munkar." Ki the people, if we give them authority on earth, if they become rulers, so there are four responsibilities they have to do. The foremost responsibilities of the ruler are to establish salah and to establish a zakat pillar and to enjoin good and to forbid evil. So Abu Bakr said, first, Holy Prophet, peace be upon you, was the head of the state. Now I am appointed as the head of the state, so it's my job to take zakat from your rich and give it back to the poor of the community. So I have to do it at every cost. And Abu Bakr made his policy very clear. Hazrat Abu Bakr said, if someone used to pay even a piece of rope in the form of zakat to the Holy Prophet, which be upon him, so he has to pay it to me, otherwise I will wage war against him. So that was a clear-cut policy of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and here. So when you are writing about refusal of zakat, so you have to give the opinion of the people who are refusing it, why they were refusing it and what was their point of view. And at the same time, you have to mention clearly that what was the point of view of Hadrat Abu Bakr and what is the teaching of Islam, obviously, about zakat. But one more thing you need to mention here, that what the other companions were saying about this issue and what Abu Bakr said to them. Look, all the problems in Arabia arose at the same time. It was not one after the other, but it was all parallel at the same time. On one side there was Suleha, on the other side there was Sajja and Muslim, on the other side there were Banu Tamim, on the other side there were uh, Qais bin Abdi Yaghus in Yemen and uh, people in Oman. So the companions were suggesting to Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an that Abu Bakr we should go one by one. First we should face false prophets only. Refusal of zakat is a minor issue, we will see it later. Otherwise, we are less in number because you should know that only Makkah and Medina were safe from apostasy. Otherwise, almost the entire peninsula was a part of apostasy. It was a very, very dangerous time. So even the com senior companions, including Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and was suggesting that we should go one after the other. The refusal of zakat issue is minor. We will see it later. But over here, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and said to Hazrat Umar, brave in idol worshipping, coward in Islam. He said to Umar, Umar, you are so brave when you were an idol worshipper in Makkah. Now you have become a coward. Why you are saying to me that we cannot fight with all of them? The people saw the courage and bravery of Hazrat Abu Bakr here. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala said something remarkable. He said, Ayun fiddini wa arahiyun? Muhammad's religion is going to be corrupted and Abu Bakr is alive? How can it be? It's impossible that someone make any change in the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the life of Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr clearly said that if someone will not support me in it, I will go alone and I will fight with them. So when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala showed that much courage, so then uh, other companions also got some motivation and they got ready to fight with the tribes again. So this you have to give all these different opinions here, the concepts here and then now we will talk about uh, the action. So we can divide this entire thing into three paragraphs. In the first paragraph, you should give the opinion of the tribes who were refusing to pay zakat and Abu Bakr's answer to them. 
In second paragraph, you can give the opinion of their companions regarding this issue and the answer of Abu Bakr to them. And in the last paragraph, you should talk about the action Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala took against them. There was a person from Banu Tamim. Banu Tamim were the most uh, important ones in it. They were leading these people who were refusing to pay zakat. So there was a person in Banu Tamim. His name was Malik bin Nuwayra. And he accepted Islam during the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, uh, and sorry, Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, appointed Malik bin Nuwera as the collector of zakat in his tribe. And he had collected a good amount of zakat from his tribesmen. But then he got to know that Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has passed away. So when he got to know about the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he returned the money back to the tribesmen. And he said, there is no need to give this money to anyone else because... Uh, it's you are the owner of your own money. So Hazrat Khalid bin Walid came after the battle of Busakha and after clearing some other places. Khalid bin Walid came to Banu Tamim and Khalid bin Walid had the interview with uh, uh, Malik bin Nuwera. And when Khalid bin Walid discovered that Malik bin Nuwera has become an apostate and at any cost he was not ready to uh, pay zakat and he was denying its obligation so Khalid bin Walid executed him and when Malik bin Nuwera was killed by Khalid his tribesmen gathered against Khalid bin Walid and Khalid bin Walid had to take action against them had a battle against them this battle is known as the battle of Buta B-U-T-A the battle of Buta and in this battle Khalid bin Walid defeated them some of them were killed, they were apostates and others surrendered and they agreed to pay zakat regularly to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. In this way, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an successfully established zakat pillar as well. And then comes the last paragraph of this answer and that will be about Abu Bakr's campaign within Arabia. These campaigns will also come in this answer because these people had accepted Islam during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, they became apostates. So it's a part of apostasy. And in my handouts, I have given four places here, a uh, campaign in Oman and Bahrain, Yemen and Hadramaut. Campaign in Yemen, I have already informed you about it. I have already informed you about Firuz Delmi and his action against the apostates in Yemen and his recapture of Sana'a of Yemen. But about Oman, uh, you should know that Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had written a letter to the king of Oman, Jafir. And at that time, even at that time, he had some reservations about Zakat. But after the explanations of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, to him about Zakat, that it's not a tax, it's a charity. It will be taken from your rich and it will be given back to your poor. He agreed to pay Zakat and he paid Zakat for a few years of the Holy Prophet's life. But when Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away, the Oman people again, again uh, refused to pay Zakat to Abu Bakr. And there was a person, Laqit bin Malik, who was leading them. And this person was also known as Zuttaj, the crowned one, because he used to keep some kind of crown on his head. So he was also known as Zuttaj, the crowned one. He was leading the apostates in Oman. And according to some reports, he even claimed to be a prophet. So in both ways, they were apostates. They refused to pay zakat, and they also believed in a false prophet, Laqit bin Malik. So that's why Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an sent Huzaifa bin Mihsan against the people of Oman. But Huzaifa bin Mihsan, when he collected the information, he got to know that Muslims were not enough with him. Apostates were so many. So that's why he asked Hazrat Abu Bakr for some reinforcements. And Hazrat Abu Bakr sent the reinforcements in the leadership of Ikrama bin Abi Jahl. So Ikrama came after being defeated by Musalma in Yamama. Ikrama was sent to Oman as the reinforcements. When he came, then Hosefa bin Mihsan attacked Oman, defeated the apostates and conquered Oman. It is known as the conquest of Oman. It's conquest. 
during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he just wrote a letter to them and they accepted Islam on his invitation, but they had their own rule and their own government. But now, Muslims are coming with force and they are invading and they are uh, forcibly controlling the land. That's why it will be known as the conquest of Oman. And now Oman has become a part of the Islamic state of Medina. And now Abu Bakr will appoint the governor here. One of the part of Arabia where apostasy took place was Bahrain. If you remember the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him's letters to the emperors, uh, we discussed that Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, wrote a letter to the king of Bahrain. And he sent that letter through Ala bin Hadrami. And the name of the king was Munzir bin Sabah, who was a very nice person. He accepted Islam on the Prophet's invitation. And following the king, all the people of Bahrain accepted Islam. But soon after the Holy Prophet's death, Munzir bin Sawa, the king of Bahrain, also passed away. And after his death, the people of Bahrain apostatized and they started believing uh, in Muslima because Bahrain and Yamama were very close to each other. So Persians used to support, used to send support to Bahrain and the Bahrain people were giving support to Muslima. So after the battle of Yamama, when the commanders were free, so Ala bin Hadrami was appointed by Hazrat Abu Bakr as a commander to attack Bahrain. And uh, he came and he defeated the people of Bahrain and Bahrain was also conquered. Another place where apostasy took place was the town of Hadramot. Yeah, over here, there was a tribe, Kinda. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and sent a commander, Muhajir bin Abi Umayyah. And some reinforcements came, the leadership of Lubayd bin Ziyad and the apostasy in uh, Hadramat was also crushed. And that was almost the end of apostasy in the peninsula of Arabia. You have to remember the dates. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away in June 632. So you can say apostasy started from July 632 and Abu Bakr, through his commanders, cleared the entire peninsula of Arabia from apostates by March 633. So around nine months were spent in uh, crushing the apostasy movement in the peninsula of Arabia. And if you see it in the lunar calendar, so Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, died in the month of Rabi Lawal 11 AH. And by the end of 11 AH, uh, the entire Arabia was united in the leadership of Abu Bakr under the banner of Islam. And from 12 AH beginning, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an will focus on outside Arabia and he will declare jihad against Persia and then Syria which we will discuss in the next video inshallah the remaining part we will discuss in the next video so today we have discussed the most important part of Hazrat Abu Bakr's caliphate his election and then his uh, action against the apostate tribes that is the remarkable uh, job Hazrat Abu Bakr did and his great test of his uh, achievements as a caliph so uh, see you inshallah in the next video. Allah Hafiz.